Let's make this the year we get to our darkest skies yet. Ryan here with Dark Rangers Inc. And I'm really excited about today's episode because we are gonna show you how to get the best results you've ever gotten while also having a great time doing it. In the last episode where I talked about my top 10 takeaways for 2024 as we go into the new year, I talked about how effort can overcome equipment. And so today we're gonna show you how to find a dark sky site and what you need to bring in order to have a successful trip and get you the best images you've ever got. So guys, you're not going to want to miss this one and stay tuned. So if you're like me, you get a little bit overwhelmed with the idea of packing up the car and getting out to dark sky sites and just finding one in the first place. I know I'm lucky here in the U.S. to have a lot of open land, um, but currently I'm not in Arizona. And so I've had to find dark sky locations from different states throughout the country. And I'm going to show you a couple of ways that I do other than the obvious Googling a dark sky park. Well, they're not located everywhere. And if you're someone who may maybe doesn't want to take a huge leap and go four or five hours away and camp for multiple nights. If you guys watched my favorite accessory video where I talk about the sky quality meter, I was able to get a full Bortle class darker by just going 12 miles north and I went from a Bortle 5 to a Bortle 4 and you could visibly see better skies. So with a 20 minute drive even, you can make a little bit of a difference and there's a pretty direct correlation between the amount of effort you're willing to put in and the results you're going to get. Now, if perhaps you're not motivated, maybe you get some pretty good stuff from your backyard and you got a nice narrow band or monochrome set up and you say, you know, I get good images from my Bortle 5, 6, 7, 8 backyard. I don't really want to go through the effort. I promise you that if you can get to a Bortle 1, 2, or 3 dark sky site and you see that data hit your phone, tablet screen, or computer screen for the first time, it will blow your mind and you will be so thankful that you decided to take the plunge and do it. This is a really big passion for me. I know I haven't been able to do a lot of travel videos lately, and that's just because of sky conditions. I do want to highlight a couple of videos that I did when the channel was brand new, and those episodes still only have between two and 300 views. And I actually put a lot of work into them, but I didn't have any subscribers at the time. So I'm going to put a link to those two in the description. And then the third one came out a little bit later with my one shot color guide for Andromeda, where I actually show you how to problem solve once you get to the site. But the first two videos, really do kind of give some amazing tips on how to find a dark sky site and I would suggest that you check them out because although the production value isn't the same as it is now so please excuse that uh, the quality of the information is definitely there so having said that I'm gonna give a quick overview on how I find dark skies after that we're gonna go over to what the bulk of this is gonna be and that is my checklist to make sure that something like this doesn't ruin my entire camping trip because if if you get to a campsite and you don't have a simple cable or something like that, it can completely shut down your imaging session. And I know the general theme of my channel is to not overthink things, but this is one of those times when you kind of have to be meticulous and you'll hear a common theme in terms of my list and my thought process in general, and that is gonna be redundancy, having backups and backup for the backup if you can. Obviously that's cost prohibitive, but in the case of having a few extra cables around or an extra battery, something like that, it can make all the difference in the world. And if you watch my Andromeda video, you'll see that I brought two of the exact same batteries and one of them said that it was 100%, but it actually wasn't. Thankfully, I had a secondary one because if not, that entire trip would have been ruined and I wouldn't have even been able to do that video. So having said that, let's go over what are some things that I look for to find some awesome dark skies to enjoy no matter where I'm located. All right, so I was trying to think of a way that I could do this and show you guys truly from scratch. So I Googled a random U.S. city generator, and I'm going to show you how I would scout it out if I got put in a situation where I didn't know where I was. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit this rerun button three times, and whatever city's in the number one spot, I'm going to show you what I would do to find a dark sky park, just so you know that I'm not cherry picking. So one, Portland, two, St. Petersburg, three, Washington, Oh, in the District of Columbia. Okay, this is, well, so this is obviously a really light polluted area, but um, we know that we have uh, Cherry Springs State Park. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of really easy. So let's do one more. 
And we'll do Garland, Texas, which looks like it's right in Dallas. So I'm going to go to light pollution map. And we're going to go to Garland, Texas. Okay. And yeah, this is like right outside of Dallas. And so I want to pick two spots. One that's like pretty close that like if I wanted to do a quick night. And then one that's like more in it for the long haul. So the first thing I would recommend guys doing, and we're not going to do this because, you know, find a dark sky park in Texas. And this is like the cheat code. We're going to have probably Big Bend. Yep, Big Bend, Enchanted Rock, Copper Break, South Yano River. So we could kind of go and take a look and see. I don't know if they have it by map, but this would be the first thing I would do. You know, obviously this is not what we're gonna do because this would be a little bit too simple, but use the resources that you have at your fingertips. And of course, you know, if one of these happens to be close by, then, you know, you've got a winner right off the bat. So we're not gonna do that because I wanna make it a little bit more uh, fun and challenging. So the first thing we do is for the quick, we will, we'll find the quick one first and then we'll go for the more in-depth one. So we're a little bit on the northeast side of this light polluted area. So for the quick spot, you know, if we look at how close, there's pretty much blue on all three of these sides from basically the northeast all the way down to the southwest, all about equidistant. And then it's kind of a disaster here to the southeast. So this whole southeast area, boom, gone, wipe that out. For a quick spot where we're not concerned about going super dark, the closest blue area, which is going to be like Bortle 2 and 3, is right up in this region. The best overall region, though, looks like it's going to be out to the west. You can get up here, which is like a Bortle 1-ish area, and pretty close to this national forest. So that could be Choctaw Nation. Anytime you're near an Indian reservation, it's almost always super dark. So those are the things that I quickly kind of look for. Um, are there any other really big cities? Houston's down there. Kind of zoom out. Here's Big Bend all the way down there. But I wonder if one of them would have been up in here in this uh, Ochita. Ochita? I'm butchering that. I'm not even going to try. So let's see, like right in here, uh, in this region... We've got the Camp Camp Maxi Military Reservation in near Chakota. That is 21.7, Bortle 3. That's pretty darn dark. Um, but we can try to find a spot kind of right in this area that's a little bit closer. Copper, I think Copper Lake, wasn't that one of them? I don't know if my memory is playing tricks on me. This is why I also don't like the dark sky because a dark sky park that's Bortle 4 is kind of sus. So let's just let's just keep it real here. But this Copper State Park is a Bortle 4. And so let's see really quickly how far is it from Garland to Copper State Park because this is definitely big enough. All these little windy roads typically mean campsites. Uh, so let's see, Copper Lake State Park to Garland, Texas. So let's go in a new window. Garland, Texas to Copper Lake State Park. And we wanna keep this around an hour, hour and a half or less for a quick one-nighter. Hour and 21 minutes, boom. All right, let's take a look at Copper Lake State Park, Texas. Let's see what we got here. Okay, it is part of the Texas State Park system, which is good. And it's not a wildlife refuge. Sometimes you can camp on wildlife refuge, but they tend to be a little pickier. Uh, looks like you can make reservations. You can stay overnight. Boom, that's a win. Okay, stay overnight. Sites, water, electricity, campsite, walk-in campsites. Beautiful. All right, so here we go. We got campsites. We have some with electricity, 25 bucks, not too bad. Some of the double campsites for 50 or 60 with a 50 amp service, I don't think we need that. So basically, this is your awesome hour and 20 minutes. It's Texas, pretty sure you can get there in an hour, especially at night, if you drive the way I would. Um, there you go, Copper Lake State Park. I do wanna go back and just see, was that one of the dark sky sites? Dark sky park. Texas. Copper Breaks. Okay, see, I'm not completely losing it. I was close. Breaks, lakes, pretty close. So now we've got our quick one. That's what I would do. That's that's a no-brainer. That's easy. Let's go, like, we want to go deep, though. Like, um, yeah, here we go. Bortle 2, 21.98. That's basically Bortle 1. 
pretty damn close. All right, let's zoom in. Do we have anything? We got nada. Okay. Um, let's check out. Let's 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 explore this. How how dark are we getting here? What are we looking at? Boral two twenty one nine seven. Okay, that's pretty. We've got this beach, Beach Creek National Scenic Area and Botanical. See, that screams we don't have campsites to me. I'm telling you, just from experience. Wild Stair Mountain Recreation Area. Now, recreation area, definitely more promising. 2193 Bortle 2. Let's go with that. Wild Stair Mountain National Recreation Area. Beautiful. All right, let's see what we got here. Rentals and guides open all year. Beautiful. Best spring, fall. It's probably pretty warm here, too. Looks like we got some equestrian trails. Boom, cabins and camping. Well, okay, pretty much just camping. That's fine. We don't necessarily need that. We got picnic tables. We even got hunting, hiking. So you even have stuff to do, horse riding. Boom. So these are two quick spots that took about five minutes. That's generally what I would do. And then I would look to see, you know, you could dig in a little bit deeper. It looks like it is at a little bit of elevation too, which is even better. Um, so that's nice. We're at about 2000 feet. So nothing crazy. 23, uh, about 2,400 feet. So a little bit of elevation, uh, nothing too crazy, but look, plenty of campsites. And then from there, I would try to find a campsite that was like towards the edge of, you know, where it's kind of at the end of one of the roads by itself. That way I'm not surrounded on both sides. And then a lot of times they let you see pictures of each campsite. So then I would go through and I would kind of scope each one and see which one didn't have trees. Just looking for other things that could get in my way. Uh, 26,000 acres, that's pretty solid. So that would be my, how I would really quickly at a glance without, you know, just Googling dark sky parks, we found a... Really nice spot that's an hour and 20 minutes away. And then we didn't see how far that was though. So let's do that. Area directions to Garland, Texas. Okay, three hours and 18 minutes. That's honestly not bad. 21.95-ish, Bortle 2, almost Bortle 1 type of site. That is really not bad for three hours. So guys, really quickly, that was just kind of a down and dirty, how do I find a dark sky site if you drop me off in the middle of nowhere? DNR land or public land that you're allowed to BLM, Bureau of Land Management. Uh, there's a lot of that out in the West where you can actually just camp for free. And then obviously Big Bend, you know, that's a hardcore 22.0, zero artificial brightness. You, If you lived in Garland, Texas, you would definitely want to make a pilgrimage to Big Bend National Park. That is, there's a reason I immediately knew that when I saw Texas. There's certain sites that are just epic. Eight hours, probably worth it. Pretty badass to see zero artificial light, legit Bortle 1. There's not too many of those laying around. So hopefully that's helpful. Now let's go ahead and dive into my checklist that has guaranteed me a successful night of camping every single time. All right, I'm not gonna go over everything visually on the list, but I did wanna pop outside and show you some of the things visually, just so you can see. You guys all know uh, my cleaning kit. I've showed you that several times. Um, so I always bring that with me everywhere. I use my iPad Pro so that I can leave my phone free. So I run everything off of this. That makes it really convenient. And then this is one of three Pelicans I use. This one has a couple different cameras in it. Uh, my reducers couple power banks. These are just to charge the phone or the tablet. I don't use these for any part of my rig. I have a GoPro 9 and 11 with the little media holders on there. They actually act as tripods and they also charge the battery. So those are really nice to have. Has the little light on the front and then the media mod microphone so it sounds a little bit better. I also, if you're just wanting to go simple, Ulanzi on Amazon sells these. They're really nice and you can hook up your cell phone and show folks uh, what you're able to do. You can set that up and it has a ball head so it angles in all different directions. I do actually use the case for the AM5, but I don't have the head in there. I have all my different spacers. I've got some really strong Gorilla Tape just in case. 
Batnoff mask, some filters that don't go on the electronic filter wheel, and then a few of the full-size Allen keys because they're really nice and have them in a bunch of different sizes, and then some of the extra parts from the mount head itself. All right, my main Pelican cases, this is the Vault V600. It fits an EcoFlow River 2 Max, and I also have the second one as well, so I have two for the uh, theme of redundancy. This will fit the AM5 head right there and the AM5 tripod, so basically everything can fit in there, waterproof, dustproof. And then the Pelican 1615 Air, this fits my 90 millimeter triplet with the camera and filter wheel. So if you wanted to take the camera off, you could probably pretty easily fit, I would say about a 120 mil, but I don't know for sure. If you guys want me to, I can measure the interior dimensions. Best sleeping pad ever. I really like Nemo for anything camping related. This is the Rome XL wide. So if you're somebody that really has to be comfortable while you're traveling, I'm over six foot and that's great. So over here, we have my infamous cable container here. It's got three or four backups of literally every kind. There's extras all over the place. So power cables, USB 2.0, 3.0, USB-C, everything that you can think of, a manual level, a nice lantern that doesn't actually get too bright. This is good for just having enough light to work on stuff, but without killing your night vision. And it's solar powered, so you can charge it during the day. A headlamp that has white and red. If you're going to a star party, you definitely want to use red only. The newest member to the team, the Sky Quality Meter. Can't wait to use this at a dark sky site. And then this is a power inverter. It takes your 12 volts and your uh, cigarette lighter basically and turns it into a normal socket. So if you have to like charge the batteries and stuff like that, that's a great way to do that. If you are a cigar aficionado, one of these Zycars is great. It's basically like a Pelican, but for your cigars. And I just keep these little Boveda packs in here and they keep perfect humidity. And then I have one of these Peak Designs tech pouches. This has all the little odds and ends, little pocket knife, multi-tools galore, tons of different batteries. I've got everything in here that's just really handy to have. And then I also use these Peak Design camera cubes for my lenses and things like that. That's the smaller one. And then I have a bigger one that can fit multiple lenses and my actual mirrorless camera inside of it and it keeps them pretty safe. These aren't technically waterproof, but the zippers are pretty good and they're considered water resistant and you can get them in all different sizes. So Peak Design makes great stuff. All right, and so with that, we'll head back inside and finish up the list. All right, now that we're inside, we're gonna go over the list. I have it comprised of three columns and we've already gone over a lot of it already. And I'll go over one column at a time and at the very end, I'll flash the whole list. That way you can take a screenshot or whatever you want. And the most important thing obviously is the list. I'm going to be referencing it. If I had it memorized then I wouldn't need it, but I don't. So the first column is camping. And so I bring my tent and my fly. I have a Marmot three season, three person tent. I always recommend getting a bigger tent than you need just for yourself. That way you have some administrative space for your tablet or your laptop, um, you know, your extra little gear and stuff that you just want to keep on you and you don't have to worry about like stashing it in the car. You can just have it right next to you. Uh, making sure that I put a tarp down. It does come with a footprint. Most tents do, but I also put a tarp down as an extra layer against whatever could be underneath there. Um, I do bring a fold up chair and a table and I choose a director style chair that has a little flip up table so I can put my iPad or a drink or some multi-tools, whatever I'm working on right there. Pillows and a sleeping bag. I actually do wring my pillows from my actual bed. I like big comfy pillows. You know, I just wash the sheets when you get home, but we're not for real camping here. It's right out of the car, so you might as well be comfortable. You're only gonna sleep a couple of nights anyway. Um, I bring a flashlight and then two headlamps. I mentioned the one outside. I do have a hand flashlight that I keep in my pocket at all times along with a multi multi-tool. And then if you are going to go to a star party, bring a headlight that's red light only. This way you can't accidentally turn on a white light and piss everybody off. Uh, I talked about the solar lamp and then solar panels. So whether you do the EcoFlow that I have or Jackery or Anchor, whatever brand battery you have, most of them are solar panel compatible. If they aren't, I would go a different route. 
If you can swing it, it's a nice thing to have for a multi-day trip. My gas stove is a GSI Outdoors, as is the set of utensils that I have. It all comes in a package, it's really nice. And then I eat those bags of food that you get from REI and you can even get them from Amazon. I get the high protein ones, they're somewhat nutritious. They do have a lot of sodium, but they will make you full. I usually just treat the whole thing as one. It says it's like multiple serving sizes, but I'm an American, so you know. And I often bring a lot of snacks and stuff like that. Just easy to eat things. You're usually only there for one, maybe two nights. So food really isn't a huge concern. I do bring a cooler and then I bring um, water and something caffeinated, something strong. I usually bring bang or something crazy that I don't normally drink, uh, but it works when I really need it to. A knife, hatchet, and firewood. Um, fire, make sure that you do put it out before you start imaging because you don't want the smoke in the air. But it is really nice, especially if it's cooler outside. It kind of gives you that childhood camping experience. So I recommend that. And then some form of self defense. If you're in the United States, rec use your second amendment. If you're not, then whatever you feel comfortable using as a form of self-defense. I've never been in a situation where it felt sketchy, but you are going to be in the middle of nowhere. You're likely not going to have cell service. And if you're going, especially by yourself, I would recommend bringing something to protect yourself. The second column is the astrophotography column. We talked about a lot of this, obviously all the basics, your mount scope, uh, your telescope cover. I bring a kettlebell for the uh, tripod itself, the ASI Air Plus, and I bring a mini as a backup, the battery charger. So the two batteries I have, I have a car battery charger. Um, I not only bring my two astro cams, but I also bring my mirrorless. That way, if I want to shoot time lapses or individual shots of the Milky Way, I can do that. Star tracker if you have one. And of course, a tripod for your camera. And then I bring batteries and I also bring a dummy battery. So this looks just like a normal Nikon battery, but it hooks up to a power supply. Uh, pro tip, if you do plug in your mirrorless camera into your ASI Air or your Eagle, whatever, with a USB-C, it will charge it um, somewhat sufficiently throughout the night. So if you do have a full battery, you'll usually wake up after a full night of shooting and the battery will still be full. I didn't realize that until I actually did it. I bring a 15 to 30 f 2.8 and a 70 to 200 f 2.8 lens um, and then I bring obviously my microphones and all my camera stuff to do the channel but you guys might not do it I talked about my accessory tech pouches and SSDs and then the third column is miscellaneous Garmin makes a really nice satellite phone for a few hundred bucks you can get the service for about 20 bucks a month and then you can just pay per text message it's really not a big deal because you're only going to use it in emergency and at that point I think a 20 cent text message will be worth it to save your life I take screenshots of all all my maps. So what I mean by this is all the surrounding area, wherever I need to navigate, where I don't know off the top of my head how to get there, I will actually screenshot Google Maps um, throughout the area. And that way, if I don't have cell service, I can rely on those maps. That has been a game changer for me and saved my butt in the past. Uh, I talked about the SQM and then a shooting plan. So if I am shooting like the couple nights before I actually go on the trip, I will just program it into my ASI Air. That way, when I get there, it's one less thing to worry about. But otherwise, I'll write it down in terms of what my targets are, you know, how many exposures and I'll plan it out. So when I get there and I'm trying to manage all the other things that are going on, I don't have to think about that. Uh, I bring uh, rain gear, hats and gloves if it's going to be like under 40 or 50 degrees. Uh, pocket tool, mini uh, multi-tool that I have in my pocket. So I have one in my tech pouch and then I have those Allen keys in the other AM5 thing. And so this way I have something on me at all times. I bring cash as well because campsites usually you can only pay with cash and for other miscellaneous stuff. Grab some ice along the way and then a, a bag full of spare clothes. And I'll usually put some of those other small items um, in that spare clothes bag. And I usually bring that in the tent with me. Um, a book for downtime. Uh, fishing pole if there is a lake nearby that's a lot of fun and then I do bring headphones and download songs off of Spotify so again if you don't have cell service you can download the songs on the way there or any YouTube videos whatever and make sure they're downloaded that way when you get there if you need them and you don't have cell service you can still access them new equipment guides downloaded so if I bought a new piece of equipment that I'm testing for the first time and I don't know it in and out I'll download the guide for the same reason no cell service and then um, a new piece of equipment is the strap wrench. So when you get out there and the temperature rises and falls, sometimes uh, those spacers, especially around your electronic filter wheel, because there is some uh, torque being applied all the time, 
those will get locked together and really the only way to get them undone is a set of rubber strap wrenches and I'll overlay what that is here. So guys, hopefully that's helpful. Let me know what you bring that I didn't include. Uh, that's not everything you could bring, but it's everything you actually would need to have a successful imaging session. Guys, I can't tell you how amazing it is to get under Bortle 1, 2, or 3 skies for the first time, or if it's been a while, it will renew your passion for the hobby and it will really make you appreciate what's up there when you can see the Milky Way clear as day with your naked eye, there's no cooler feeling. So get out, go on a new moon, challenge yourself, get outside your comfort zone and get the best astrophotography images you've ever gotten in your life. So until the next one, guys, clear skies.